Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I never realized that a close reading could be so dangerous. Uh, <laughs> my uh, habits of the heart are clearly clearer than I thought they were. Um, I also didn't realize that this was going to be the 13th, and I hope tonight not to confirm anybody in their superstitions. Um, I never met uh, Dallas Smythe, unfortunately, but um, I saw him once from a distance, but never actually uh, got to meet him. Um, but when I began to prepare my uh, doctoral dissertation back in 19, the late 1960s, I found myself, myself as one does, plowing through uh, former issues of journals, notably the Journal of Communication, which at that point was a very dreary exercise indeed. Uh, it's gone through other periods of dreariness at times since, but um, then it really was very depressing. Uh, it, I read piece after piece after piece, hoping for some illumination and not finding it. And then suddenly I came across a piece by Dallas Smythe and found myself wondering, how the hell did this guy get in here? Um, simply because its tone and its focus uh, were so refreshingly different and actually about something was, that was worth thinking about. So thank you, Dallas, for helping me on my way. Um, the variety of bodies, of cultures, and languages in the Americas is one of our great strengths in this hemisphere. And it's a strength which has been intensified by the widespread immigration of people who don't speak English since the 1960s into the heartlands of English language dominance, Canada and the United States, but also of Quechua, Aymara, Mapuche, Guarani, and Maya speakers, amongst others, to Latin American cities. However, there's also a profound cultural unity in the Americas. Very regrettably, indeed tragically, this unifying cultural bond through the hemisphere is highly destructive, strangling our, pot our potential for progress. It crimps every corner of our lives, whether we want it to or not, whether we realize it or not. From our child rearing to our politics, from our job prospects to our internet sites, from our healthcare systems to our educational institutions. The cultural bond in question is the deeply impacted bond of Euro racism, from Tierra del Fuego to Nunavut and Alaska. And not only racism itself, but its first line of defense, namely the denial that racism is a sufficiently energetic force in our societies today to still matter. This denial takes varying forms and is the topic of this lecture. It's a denial which is also contested, and at times we'll take a look at some of the ways in which it is being currently challenged. I'll begin with the United States because as current superpower, it's the most familiar ground to everybody. Indeed, one of the points that Canadians, Chileans, Colombians, Quebecois, and Cubans, not to mention the nationals of other countries in the hemisphere, will readily agree on is that the USA is the natural homeland of racism, racism of all kinds, both domestically and in the conduct of its foreign policy. They will rightly point to its history of enslaving Africans and decimating Aboriginal Americans, of excluding Chinese workers and interning Japanese Americans, of colonizing the Philippines and pulverizing <coughs> Iraq. For the moment, I'll skip over the various resonances here in Chile, Colombia, Cuba, Canada, Quebec, and so on, but we will have reason to come back to them. The roles that US media representations have played in this process have by now been very exhaustively documented and discussed, as we see in works by scholars such as John Noriega, Oscar Gandhi, Herman Gray, Vera Smith Shamade, Edward Said, Charles Ramirez Berg, Otto Santa Anna, Craig <coughs> Watkins, J.D. Rivero, and many others. The essence of the matter, again, though, for my present purposes, is not simply the articulation of racism, but its denial, the refusal to admit its staying power. And at this juncture, then, in US public discourse, we face two rival syllogisms. Both start from the same two points, 
the legal obstacles to justice and full citizenship for people of color were overthrown 40 and 50 years ago. And there has been an expansion, also sometimes a contraction, of welfare provision since then. However, second point in the, in the case, notwithstanding the emergence of a growing lower middle class and professional middle class of color, these legal landmarks have evidently not achieved their goals given how race intersects so substantially still in the USA with poverty, poor educational achievement, and prisonization. <clears throat> but here, the syllogisms suddenly split, so they suddenly become two. For some people, this failure means devising more energetic and imaginative public policies in active participation with those communities most impacted to level the playing field and to erode institutional racism. For others, the situation of most black people, Latinos and Native Americans is plainly hopeless and is best explained either by some mystical version of genetic science or by some version of the culture of poverty ideology that masquerades as social science. <coughs> Other versions of the culture of poverty discourse with a consummately vague notion of the underclass as a stand-in for African Americans and welfare dependency as a way of life. Now, basing themselves on the hopelessness perspective in one or other of its versions, a slew of writers, a number of them individuals of color, have concluded that any and all affirmative action programs, including the ones that ease them, in many cases, into their own present careers, are no longer needed, if indeed they ever were. Contrary to W.E.B. Du Bois, their view of the talented tent for successful individuals of color would have those individuals pull up the ladder behind them and simply leave the rest of the community to rot. Some argue affirmative action programs are actually damaging because they stigmatize people of color as needing special assistance. Though if that stigma is the worst people have to encounter, we're in very good shape indeed. Robert Entman and Andrew Rojecki in their book, The Black Image and the White Mind, call this the discourse of modern racism. In other words, racist beliefs and practices no longer based, founded on some spurious biological or genetic tropes. Very often, this is based on a notion that different cultures and therefore cultural identities and therefore collective social behaviors are like oil and water, absolutely separate and irreconcilable. Some writers term this cultural racism to distinguish it from the old biological racism. However, in his recent study, when affirmative action was white, Columbia University political scientist Ira Katznelson has ably analyzed the extensive post-World War II history of public policies entrenching affirmative action for white Americans. He's shown into sharp relief, he has thrown sorry, into sharp relief the mass of carefully engineered policies that serve to block black and Latino migrant workers from taking advantage of capitalist economic growth and the impact of those policies on the generational cohort of the 1950s and 1960s has not magically dissipated and disappeared from the lives of their children and grandchildren. Yet in anti-affirmative action discourse, this all too concrete historical dimension vanishes from view, either in a cloud of speculative mass psychology about the so-called culture of poverty or seemingly fails to compete with the obsessive lure which the fantasy of explain all genetics has for much of the US intelligentsia. There have been foundations uh, pouring a great deal of money into uh, this campaign against any and all forms of affirmative action for people of color. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, you'll be glad to know, has put some of his considerable fortune that way as well. And in Canada, there have been echo figures such as Neil Bissendeuf <laughs> and Sawanda Suganasuri, not to mention the lovely Barbara Amiel and the equally charming Christy Blatchford. One of the most dazzlingly insightful mantras in these exalted circles has been that if they term their own opinions politically incorrect, then by God, those opinions must be automatically and self-evidently fact. However, the roles of US corporate media 
have not been restricted to airing or, in a number of cases, highlighting opinions against affirmative action policies. In a careful study of US commercial media representation of the linked issues of poverty, welfare, and race for most of the period since World War II, Martin Gillens has shown how welfare programs have been particularly associated in the media, in the US media, with black communities, at a level almost twice as high as the actual percentage of black welfare recipients. To clarify, the actual percentage of poor people who are black in the United States averaged over time just below 30% of the total poor, though on some individual indices, the percentages were a few points higher. Nonetheless, a routine virtual doubling of photographic representation of black poor people was evident in the three leading news magazines, Time, Newsweek, and US News and World Report, and was even more accentuated in television news. He focused especially on the news magazine photographs, arguing that these are more likely to draw readers' attention and to linger in their memories than the details of the stories that accompany them. He also underscored how important Time and Newsweek have been, in particular, as sources most journalists routinely read, and that this is true also for overseas foreign correspondents reporting on the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. He also demonstrated how in stories covering poverty during periods of sharp economic recession, the news magazine photos were overwhelmingly of white victims of the recession. Furthermore, he found the photos of elderly welfare recipients, who obviously are a sympathetic subgroup in this citizen category, exclusively featured the white elderly. Adult black welfare recipients were only portrayed as of working age, which clicked into place with a common and historically entrenched stereotype that black people able to work preferred not to because of inherent laziness. What is absolutely off the agenda in US corporate media is any discussion of the privileges of whiteness in the USA. George Lipset's book, The Possessive Investment in Whiteness, has been out for 10 years now, and in the academic literature on whiteness continues to be the most penetrating as well as lucid treatment of the subject. Yet just as poverty in the USA was off the public agenda, until President Kennedy was shown socialist writer Michael Harrington's The Other America, in the USA we are still waiting for the freest and finest media system in the planet to dare to place systematically the topic of entrenched white privilege on the talk shows, the op-ed pages, and the political news magazines. In other words, at this level of media operation in the USA, denial reigns denial that institutional racism still is everywhere, denial that white privilege should actually be a serious topic for delicate white eyes and sensitive white ears, denial that any concrete policy shifts demand to be hammered out in serious ongoing consultations with communities of color as opposed to former President Clinton's superficial town meetings on race, which went nowhere. Recent media coverage of the Obama presidential candidacy has thrown up some significant illustrations of the racial impasse that bedevils the USA. And I'll just pick one dimension of it. We can talk more about this later if you so wish. There's been an instantaneous consensus that the Reverend Jeremiah Wright is indeed an appalling specimen of humanity. Based on an endless loop of a few seconds out of a 35-minute sermon in which, at that point, he was explaining how often people in the rest of the world do not parrot the words, God bless America, but rather say, God damn America. This has been defined as blasphemy rather than truth-telling. In the process, it has been rather like a rerun of the Willie Horton scenario of the 1988 presidential election, in which, as some of you may recall, the repeat crimes of a black parolee rapist were used by Bush Sr. to attack the Democratic Party presidential contender. In both cases, 
totally unacceptable black man has been the devil, summoned up to try to dislodge the candidacy of a contender for the presidency, summoned up to stand as the ultimate symbol of intolerable <coughs> danger. Obama's response has been to try to explain the sources of the minefield of race and to urge Americans to engage with each other in frank dialogue on the subject over the next decades so that the subject may lose its ongoing power to distract from real issues, real issues of privilege and social class, of corruption and poverty. <clears throat> 